Brian, I'm going to just give you the full time here. So let's pray, and then we'll just release Brian uh, into the message. Pastor Paul's also got uh, those bulletins for notes. Uh, so if you'd like any of those, um, just lift your hand, and Paul will hook you up for some notes here. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for Brian and his ministry this week and how you've used him in so many ways. And I just thank you for the anointing on him and his ministry. And I thank you for his uh, passion for you and your word. And I pray that your word would uh, just continue to go forth with such power tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brian. There we go. All right, we are, uh, yeah. we are gonna pick up where we left off. I'll tell you, I am excited to share this. At the same time, I'm sad that this is our last evening, but uh, I know that you're going to just really appreciate what you're going to see as we bring this to its head. So let's pick up here in Genesis chapter three, verse six. It says this, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. I believe that this is one of many misunderstood sections of Scripture. I think that we have grown up thinking things, just like we've always you know, grown up believing that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, an apple, right? When the scripture doesn't say that. But we've heard it so many times that we have formed a worldview, even within Christianity, that isn't biblical. It's just traditional, more than biblical. And what we see here is now Satan is coming to this woman, Eve, as a liberator, as a friend, not as an enemy, not as a foe, not any of that. He's sowing discontentment in her. That there are things out there that you should have that you don't have right now. And so that's one of the first things that he does is to sow that discontentment in the woman. He does the same thing with us today, right? Uh, especially to a woman. It's not good enough for you just to be a godly spouse, a godly wife, to be a godly mother, to train your children. That's not good enough. I touched on it yesterday, but the, the Woman's Lib movement uh, has had Satan's fingerprints all over it. Now, don't get me wrong, I am all about women being able to, to vote and all about women being able to get paid equally. I, I, I'm all for that. But when you look at the Women's Lib Movement, what it has all been, it's been about discontentment of what is right and good. You just do some research of where this began and you will see it was point blank. They say the Bible is what has kept women to be slaves. Point blank, they will attack the Bible and say, as a matter of fact, rather than it being a blessing for you to be a godly woman, a godly wife, a godly mother, that's what's holding you back. Robbing you and stealing the blessings that God has for you as he sows that discontentment in your life. Satan always does this. We talked about it last night. He comes as an angel of light. And so... How does the woman respond? Well, the woman saw, okay, Satan got her to turn her head. That's the very first thing that he does, is he gets our eyes off of the word onto something else, to turn our head away from scripture. The woman saw. Very simple words, but a lot more there than I think that we really take time to, to stop and think about. You see, there are three things that are mentioned here. She sees that the woman saw that the fruit was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom. Those three things. Now this is very important. These three particulars here. You see, the word 
for desirable. It's desirable for gaining wisdom. It's the same word for covet. There's a commandment against that, by the way. Right? Thou shalt not covet. Well, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, very interesting verse that's going to bring this connection uh, to a head as well. It says this, For all that is in the world, not some, all, everything, everything that is in this world can fall under these same categories. Look, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God, goes against those things, abides forever. What's so neat about this to me, is what he's saying ultimately is all the sins in the world can be falling under one of those three categories. Okay? The lust of the eyes, all the things that we covet, all the things that we want. The pride of the heart. Okay, what we, what we can have, what we can gain, that what people think of us, okay, trying to please men. One of my favorite verses, Galatians 1.10, it says this, if I should yet seek to please men, I should not be a servant of Christ Jesus. See, I'm not here to please you, although my heart wants that. My pride, my, my flesh really wants you to like me. But that's not why I'm here, and I cannot let that rule my life and, and determine what I will say to you. Okay? Pornography, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. But what I love about this is I think that we can go all the way to Matthew chapter 4, and it's going to point us all the way back to right here in the Garden of Eden in this fall. Because do you know that the devil threw the exact same things at Jesus? When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, every single one of the things that Eve fell to here that are listed in Genesis, the lust of the eyes, okay, the, the pride of what you can have, and the lust of the flesh, all, every bit of it, Satan threw at Jesus. What I like about that is this. Jesus came to fulfill that law that we can't for us. But what we are unable to do, what Eve was unable to do, he did for us. Remember the devil? The first thing that happens, and we talked about it last night too, when, when he had fasted for 40 days, Jesus had, the devil comes at a moment when he's hungry, I'm sure, and says, here, turn these stones into bread. Jesus was hungry. The lust of the flesh. I'm sure he was hungry. But with the word, he overcame, as we talked about last night. Then the next thing is, the devil takes him, and he says, look at all these kingdoms. Look how beautiful they are. Look at this. It could all be yours. The lust of the eyes, what he could see. But Jesus overcomes with the word. And then he takes him to the pinnacle of the temple and says, if you really are God, prove it. Cast yourself off here, for it is written that the angels will guard you. Okay. By the way, the devil left off just three little words, four words, in all your ways. So the devil quoted scripture, by the way, he just did it out of context. But Jesus, again, through the word, overcomes. So every, in, in, in essence, what John is saying, everything in the world falls under those categories. The devil threw everything he had at him. And Jesus overcame every bit of it for us. But clearly, this is taking us back to the garden. But Satan was able to get the woman's head to turn off of God's commands, off of what God said to one of those worldly things. Jesus never took his head off of his father. And you know, that's what Hebrews tells us that we too are supposed to do. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, enduring the cross, scorning at shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, guys, we are to not just glance at God, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the Word of God, the author and perfecter of our faith, 
Do not let Satan turn your head. I think I mentioned it before, but David and Bathsheba. You see, the, the sin started long before that night. It started with David's lust and not turning his head long before, gathering many wives like he wasn't supposed to. And then he couldn't sleep one night, and I'm sure it was the devil keeping him up at night too. But rather than going to the Word, his, the lust of the eyes and the flesh, he saw this woman bathing. You see, Satan will keep you up at night at times. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Go to him in prayer. When your mind starts thinking about things you shouldn't be thinking about, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Well, moving on, this whole tree, as we said, is deceptive. Okay? It, it, it smelled good according to the book of Enoch, right? It, it, it was beautiful. It, it was attractive. It had great fruit on it. The woman saw it. It's pleasing to the eye. It's good for food, and it can give me wisdom. Everything about it was attractive. It didn't drip maggots. It didn't stink. And as I said before, that's the way sin is. But this is how Satan got Eve to bend her will, to give her heart to him. 2 Timothy 2.25 says, In humility, we are to do this, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. This verse is basically showing us one of our goals as Christians is to bring those who are in opposition to God to repentance, to warn them, to steer them away, to get their heads back on the word, back on Jesus. That has to be one of our goals. Well, it didn't happen here in this situation as we know. You see, Eve fell before even consulting her husband. I think that's what she should have done, is probably said, you know what, something doesn't sound right here with the word that I'm hearing. Let me go talk to my husband. But she doesn't do that. Okay? Now, we'll, we'll get to that. I mean, eventually he's going to be there. We know that. But I believe that Adam was the primary target. I asked you this last night. Why did God, or why did the devil, rather, go after the woman? Tell you what, anybody will tell you, you've got to go after the head, right? You read after the, the battles, you go after the kingpin, right? You wanted the kings. When Jehoshaphat and Ahab were out of battle... He's, the, 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 Ar the Arameans, they said, go after nobody but Jeho the king, Ahab. Satan knew he had to go after the head. And if he could get the head, he gets it all. I'll tell you something, guys. Remember I said Adam was placed in the garden as a protector. And you men, you are the protector of your garden, your home. Satan wants you. He wants the head. And I don't, I don't know if Pastor Russ is still in here or not. He was giving me some statistics, and I've heard this type of thing before. But bottom line is, guys, do you know that if there's a man in faith and the woman is not, statistically, eventually, she's going to come along. When the woman is the head in the house, when the woman is the Christian and the man is not, you don't have near the statistical uh, results. I was telling somebody the other night, I, I see hundreds of churches. Okay? I, I travel the country, I see hundreds of churches. And do you know what's a common theme that I see everywhere I go? When I see a church that has a strong men's Bible study going on, men involved in the church, it's usually a pretty healthy church. Now that's not to say that the women's groups and the things are bad. No, those are wonderful and we need those too. But what I'm saying is if men aren't standing up doing their job, there's a problem. The head is what guides the body. There's a problem. Satan knew he had, in order to get to Adam, he was going to have to go around it a different way because I think he knew Satan 
would not be able to get Adam to fall. He could not deceive Adam. Now, I also don't believe that it was a surprise for him then that when Adam ate, he's like, oh, you know, I got Eve to eat it, now Adam's eating it too? Yes, two for one. I don't think he was saying that. I think that that was his primary goal, and I think Eve was just step number one, and that was just a side issue. I don't really care. I'm doing this to get to Adam. When Adam ate, that was the prize. That was the goal. And I think I can prove this scripturally. I brought up Enoch before, just in case you weren't here before. I just have to make this very clear. I do not believe Enoch is a book of the Bible should not be. It's quoted in the book of the Bible and in Jude. Okay, but what we have today, I don't believe, is the original book of Enoch. But I think there's some good history in it. And 2 Enoch, chapter 31, verse 5, says this about Satan's strategy. The devil understood his condemnation and the sin which he had sinned before. In other words, the devil knew, I'm, I have fallen. So what am I going to do? It says then, therefore, he conceived thought against Adam. Not Eve, against Adam. In such form he entered and seduced Eva, or Eve, but did not touch Adam. In other words, if this historical record is correct, what it's saying is Satan knew he had fallen, and because he had fallen, he was going to go after somebody else, but his goal was to get Adam, but to do so, he knew he had to go through Eve. So here's an extra biblical source supporting what I'm telling you. But here's the biblical proof. Adam did not. He was not deceived. That is what the New Testament tells me. When I read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, it says, And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but be in silence. Why? Not because it was cultural, not because they had a low view of women. It was quite the opposite. Here's the reason. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived. But the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Now, wait a minute. Adam ate. If Adam ate, how can he not be deceived? I can tell you one thing, as a matter of biblical fact, Adam was not deceived. So how are we going to reconcile this fact? That he ate, but was not deceived. Well, we'll see here. Rabbi Eliezer, he is a, a very famous, very well-respected rabbi among uh, Judaism today. Okay? goes all the way back to the time of Christ, just about, the first century. We see Rabbi Eliezer. Uh, he was a, a teacher of Rabbi Akiva, who was this one that was nuts that proclaimed somebody else to be the Messiah. But he was also, uh, basically, he, married, he was married to the daughter of Gamliel. Now, Gamliel is a rabbi mentioned in Scripture in the book of Acts, chapter 5. And so we're talking about taking you all the way back to the time of Jesus here, and this is what this rabbi says why Satan went after the woman, or what was going on here. Okay, this is his commentary. This isn't scripture, it's his commentary on scripture. He says, the serpent argued with itself, saying, if I go and speak to Adam, I know that he will not listen to me. For a man is always hard to persuade. But behold, I will speak to Eve, for I know that she will listen to me, for a woman, or for women, listen to all creatures. Now, before you guys get your feathers ruffled here, okay, I want you to understand something. We're not saying that a woman will fall for everything, that she's dumb and that she's gullible. That's not what we're saying here. What we're saying is this. I think you women know men are not good listeners. <laughs> right? We are not good listeners. Uh, but it, it's much more than that. 
We do listen, but to a, a small select group of people sometimes. Okay? I know I got, I've got women glaring at me already. <laughs> You'll see. Just hang in there, okay? Men are, are, are not good listeners. But what I want you to see from this scripture, or not scripture, but this commentary on the scripture is this. That the devil seems to understand that men and women are different. We think differently. We behave differently. Act differently, right? Again, contrary to our society, where we're trying to say, no, we're the same. No, we are different, and even the devil knows that. I'll tell you one thing. I believe a woman is much more sensitive to the Holy Spirit than a man. I've been married for 27 years now, and I'll tell you, I'm just, just starting to learn that I need to listen to my wife a lot more. <laughs> okay, it's taken me 20... That's how slow I am. But there are many times when she says, I don't think you should do this, or I don't think you should say that, and I do it anyway, and I find out she was right. Okay? I really believe women are much more sensitive to the Spirit. They're better listeners than we are. So... When it says that a woman will listen to anything, sometimes that can be a good thing. As long as you're listening to the right people, right? Which means this can be your strength, not a weakness. It can be a weakness, but it doesn't have to be. It can be your strength to be a good listener, to hear the Holy Spirit, to hear that word. But... Let's move on here for now. You're gonna, we're going to put this together. You see, I believe that Adam was untouchable. He had complete authority, complete power. Satan knew that. He thought, nope, this isn't going to happen. He's the head. I can't get to him, so I've got to go to somebody else. And so he went in through the back door because he knew that Adam, the only way was going to be to go through the woman who had his heart, Eve. Now, the lesson that I want to take with this is that women, you have a connection. If you're married, someday maybe you'll be married, you will have a connection with a husband that nobody else can. And I'm telling you, I, I, I know through my own experience that is true. I have a connection with my wife that there is nobody else in this world that can replace that. The point is this, women, then. You have power. Unbelievable power. And that power can be used for good or it can be used for evil. When God said that he was going to create a help meet for man. Remember I said, yeah, you know why? Because we need it desperately. And if that woman, that woman will take her role and her gifting seriously, you can be the greatest help and asset to a man that God has ever given me, or us as men. But if you take your eyes off of Jesus, if you allow your head to be turned, you can also be the biggest detriment to the head of your home as well. You have way more power than you realize. Power to bring life or power to bring death to that home. To encourage your husband to lead, to strengthen him in his leading, or to tear him down and discourage him from being a leader. Now, I understand that we are in a fallen world, in our society especially, there's a lot of men who are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, continue to encourage and love your husband so that hopefully he will step up and do what he's supposed to be doing. But I'll tell you what, if you have a godly man and a godly woman behind her, or him, oh, what a power force that is. It's unbelievable. <clears throat> and so I want this to be an encouragement because you can push your husband closer to Jesus or you can push him further away. 
And I, I really, truly don't believe you realize how much power you have in doing that. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 4 says this, as they entered the promised land, Moses is warning them not to take foreign wives because God told Moses to warn them. Why? He says, for they will, not they might, they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods so that the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. Guys, I can give you so many examples from Scripture where the woman has the power to either build up or tear down. God warns us in Scripture about this. He warns us, I made that woman to be a helper. I made her to be powerful for you. How about we see in Solomon's case, what was his downfall? The wisest man that ever lived, a woman. Doesn't sound like somebody weak to me. To bring down the most wise man that ever lived. I think Satan knew that. Satan knew it with David and Bathsheba too, didn't he? Okay, we can go on to so many examples. That's why the Bible warns us too about being unequally yoked, how important that is, because he knows that we will be led astray by the one who has full access to our heart. We could go on and look at Ahab. Ahab married that wicked Jezebel. She didn't influence her husband at all, did she? Yes, she did, in every way. Okay, there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. 2 Kings 8, 18, Jehoram, he walked in the way of the kings of Israel just as the house of Ahab had done. Why? For the daughter of Ahab was his wife. Why was he wicked? His wife. Again, women, the takeaway is the devil is looking for an opportunity to go and destroy the head of the house. Who do you think he's going to go after to do it? You, the woman. He doesn't change things up. The same thing he did in the garden, he's going to do in your home. He is going to go after you to get to your husband, to help your husband fall, so that he doesn't lead like he's supposed to. Now, I'm not putting blame on you. I'm saying you have power to encourage maybe a husband who is not standing up like he should be, or to tear down and, and not give him those opportunities and push him to be the man that he should be. Because there were plenty of righteous women. And lots of them. Ruth, Rahab, Esther, Sarah. Lots of godly women who led their husbands and helped their husbands, I should say. Remember, even in the New Testament, it says that women should be godly like Sarah, who submitted to her husband. Okay? So, Sarah was a great helpmeet to Abraham. I'm not saying she was perfect. Nobody is, just like no man is. We could even look at Samson. Remember Delilah? I mean, Samson fell because of a woman. Balaam and Balak, remember Balaam and the donkey that talked? God calls Balaam to go pronounce a curse, or not God, but Balak calls Balaam to go and pronounce a curse on Israel. By the way, Israel was untouchable. Just like Adam was untouchable. And so Balaam's on the way to curse Israel. And the donkey keeps going off to the side, and finally he gets so mad, and he starts beating his donkey, and God opens the mouth of the donkey, and, you know, it basically says, why are you beating me these three times? He said, and then God opens Balaam's eyes, and he sees there was an angel of death, basically, in front of them. The, the donkey had been trying to save Balaam's life. Well, God says, don't you dare say any, you, know, you just say what I tell you to say, and that's it. So Balaam goes... 
And he takes a, Balak takes him up to this top of the hill, and he says, listen, the Israelites, there's so many of them. We've heard what's happened. They're going to destroy us. We want you to curse them. So he goes and he makes these sacrifices. He comes back and he says, I'm going to bless Israel. He can only bless them because that's what God puts in, in his mouth. And Balak is like, stop, stop. What are you doing? I told you to curse them, not bless them. And he says, I told you I could only say what God tells me. So he takes him to another spot where he can see fewer of Israel. Not the whole group, but just a few of them. Same thing happens. Takes him to another spot where he can just see this small group because all ba Balak just wants some of them to be cursed because they're untouchable. And he can only bless them. And what happens is we read a couple of chapters later, Balaam is killed because Balaam realized, I can't curse Israel. You know why? Because they're walking in obedience to God. They're protected. And so Balaam goes and tells Balak, he says, the only way you're going to get them to fall is if you get your women to go and get them to you know, start sleeping with your women and, and, and go against God's word. And so these women come in, and it's the women that make the untouchable touchable. And we have the, the Baal of Peor, that whole incident that, that goes on there with, uh, with that. But bottom line is, women, you've got power. And Satan is going to go after you. And I hope that that is enough for you to think about what you need to do in your marriage to help your husband be the godly man he needs to be because we need you. I need my spouse, I need my wife to be the man God intended me to be. That's how important you are. Now, going back here to Genesis 3, we see this. In verse 6, it says, She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, a lot of people look at this and they say, Oh, see, Adam was there. I don't believe this is saying he was right next to her side. I believe Adam was not there. What he's saying is he gave some to her husband who was with her in the garden. Okay, he's with her. This is what he's saying. I, I, I don't think Eve came home and said, hey, you know, I was at the grocery store and I uh, picked some, some of this fruit. Would you like some? And, you know, trying to trick Adam. We don't know what happened. We don't know the dialogue. There's no dialogue recorded here. We just know the, the basic facts of what's going on. But the number one reason why I know that Adam was not there right away eating it is because of some other scriptures that I'm about to give you. And the fact that it says Eve was deceived, Adam was not. Remember, I said Adam was called to protect the garden, to protect his house, and yet he ate if he was the protector, why did he eat? If he wasn't deceived, how, how and why did he eat? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 has some very interesting details about this. In verse 21 it says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. How come it doesn't say, for as in Eve, all die? I got news for you. The Bible says Adam was not deceived, but yet who gets the blame for it? Adam. Adam is the one who is held accountable, not Eve. Even though she was the one that was deceived, Adam takes the accountability. Isn't that interesting? Guys, this is the most important thing. I want you to hear this. Adam, because he is the head of the house, bears the responsibility. When I counsel people, marriages, I'll tell you what, I know some, there are some women out there that are just about impossible to live with. But you know what else I know? I always say it's the man's fault. 
It's always the man's fault. Why is your wife impossible to live with? Are you not loving her like you're supposed to? Are, are, are you not doing devotions with her and, and leading her and washing her and cleansing her with the water of the word like the Bible says you're supposed to be doing? Are you doing your job? There's a reason that maybe she's not being the woman that she's supposed to be. Okay, now again, I'm not saying women aren't at fault at things, but I'm telling you this, you're going to take the blame for it. Because you are the one that's the head of that house. It is your job to protect that home. It is your job to be teaching and training your children. It is your job to be the spiritual head. It is your job to be loving your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is huge. It is huge. As you're about to see. By the way, just to show you this aspect that the man takes the accountability. The man has the authority. Even in the Old Testament here in the book of Numbers, we see about taking a vow. I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'm just going to give you the highlights of it. It says that if a man makes a vow to the Lord, okay, swears an oath or whatever, it says he shall do whatever he, he vows. He's under that oath. Then it goes and it says, but if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and her father hears about it and says, no, 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 you can't do this, my daughter, then that vow is null and void. If the father hears about it and he says, okay, then that, that vow stands. And then if that woman goes and gets married, if she takes a husband and she makes a vow, if her husband overrules her on that day that he hears about this vow, he says, that, void, that voids the vow. You see, if your wife takes a vow and the husband says, no, I don't agree with this, it's null and void. Because he's the head, he is the authority of that house. He takes responsibility for that vow. Okay? Well, Rabbi Eliezer, again, records this, that Eve tried to persuade Adam because... She didn't want to die herself, by herself. And that she was afraid that God was going to make another woman for her husband. Okay, this is what is recorded. Again, not the Bible, just commentary on Scripture. Who knows? But all I know is it's 2,000 years closer to it than we are. The serpent went and said to the woman, Behold, I touched it, the tree, but I didn't die, so you can touch it. And you're not going to die. The woman went and touched the tree, and she saw the angel of death coming towards her and said, oh, Woe is me! I shall now die, and the Holy One, blessed be he, will make another woman and give her to Adam. But behold, I will cause him to eat with me, and if we shall die, we shall both die. If we shall live, we both shall live. Hmm. What's that mean? Well, I think this is what it means. 1 Timothy 2.14, again, just to show you, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. If it's a matter of fact that he was not deceived, that means he was willing. Right? If he wasn't deceived, then he was willful in eating this apple. I got to ask. I've been telling you that we know Adam is a Christ figure. Is it possible that as that Christ figure, that Adam willingly ate of the fruit of that tree to take sin upon himself, to take accountability? For the sin of the bride, his wife, so that she would not have to die. Is that not the gospel of what Jesus Christ has done to a T for us? He said, I am the head. That's what the Bible says, right? He is the head of the church. And so who's going to take responsibility for our sins? He says, I will. I'll take accountability for it. 
He's not deceived. He willingly gave his life. He willingly went to that cross because for God so loved the bride, the church, the world, that he gave. You see, guys, I think that's why Adam, I think Adam has gotten a bad rap. We always think growing up in the church, oh, if Adam would have only not eaten of that thing. You know what? That's like saying if Jesus would have only not died on the cross. The Bible says he was not deceived, but he does take accountability. And just as in through Adam all sinned, so also the second Adam, the, the, the person who's going to come. Why is Jesus called the second Adam? Because he's doing the same thing Adam did. But just as in through one, death came through the other life. You see, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, speaks of Jesus in this way. It says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Why do you think those words were used? That Jesus tasted death for us. I think that's supposed to point us back to the Garden of Eden. That as in Adam, as he ate and tasted death for his bride, that Jesus Christ came and took accountability for us. And he tasted death for everyone. For 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin, who was not deceived, to be sin for us, as I believe Adam became sin for his wife Eve, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Remember what John said about Jesus? Jesus his words are recorded saying, no one takes my life from me. He says, but I, I lay it down on my own accord, willingly. Husbands, this is the kind of love we're supposed to have for our wives. Wow, huh? Wives, isn't this the kind of husband you want? You have power to help that. That's what you were created to be, a helpmeet for your husband. I think that if we both take this more seriously. I think that marriages can improve. I think marriages can be more Christ-like if we have this as our focus. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, it says husbands love your wives like that in Ephesians. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, I'll bet that if you start loving your wives like that, I'll bet wives won't have such a problem being submissive. And maybe women, if you're a little bit more submissive, husbands might find it a little easier loving, your wife, loving their wives like that. Maybe if we're both some more submissive to the roles that God has ordained for us in a marriage, marriages are going to get better. Thanks be to God for taking our accountability. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being the second Adam. We thank you that though we deserved death because we have sinned, we have been deceived that you were not, that you willingly gave your life, that you willingly tasted death and took our sins upon your body for us, that we might live forever reigning righteously because of you. Thank you, Jesus, for that wonderful, wonderful truth. May we never forget it. In Jesus' name. Amen.